no matter how difficult the situation you're in is, and no matter how high that so-called mountain is to climb, is that you never, ever give up. Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast, where it's all about learning from the best minds in the sport so you can train smarter, stay healthy, and run faster now. And now your host, Tina Muir. Hello, this is Tina Muir. Thank you so much for tuning in for the latest episode of the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast. So, last week we heard from yoga instructor and runner Cara Gilman, and she talked about how just five minutes a day of yoga could have a significant impact on your running. If you haven't already checked it out, I would definitely recommend going back after this episode, of course. So this is a time of year where most of the full marathons are now complete or any other races. One of the last big ones, uh, the Cal International, is this weekend, if you are listening to this the day it comes out, that is. But for many runners, myself included, our peak race now seems like a lifetime ago. And this is the time when our motivation really starts to flag. Most of our runs are completed in the dark, and the cold makes it really tempting to just stay inside and skip training, especially when, you know, your spring races seem like they're such a long time away, and what harm is it going to do right now? So I thought this would be a good time to bring on a motivational guest, but I haven't just got any motivational guests for you. This is one of the best in the world, and his stories, the way he shares his greatest triumphs and his setbacks... It will have you at the edge of your seats or whatever else you're sitting on (laughs) for the entire time, I promise. I'd always heard he was a great motivational speaker, but today I learned just how inspirational he is. If you need any kind of kick to make yourself get back on track for your training, this is it. And if you haven't already, I would love if you could subscribe to the podcast so that each week you get them straight to your inbox or you get them straight to your phone if you're using that. And then you can find them straight there rather than having to search online for them. So my guest today is Dick Beardsley. He's best known for the close finishes um, at the London Marathon in 1981 and most famously with Alberto Salazar in 1982, which you're going to hear that story today, and trust me, you want to listen. He was inducted into the 2010 National Distance Running Hall of Fame, and he's now an international best-selling author, motivational speaker, was the subject of a feature film, how cool is that, and is often the keynote speaker at many events, including many Fortune 500 events. So today, Dick is going to share his running journey with us, including that infamous Boston Marathon race with Alberto Salazar, which was considered the greatest marathon finish of all time, and you can definitely see why after listening. He's also going to share his addiction to painkiller story and how rehabbing from that was a hundred times worse than any other pain or struggle he's been through. It help, it's hard to even imagine, but he kind of gives some kind of glimpse of what it would be like. But it's really an interesting story, and you're gonna you're gonna really find a lot out of it. And finally, how you can learn to appreciate every single run, and how that can change your perspective, not only in your training but on your life. So, are you ready? Let's go meet him. Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast, Dick. Hey, thank you, Tina. Glad to be here. I'm excited to have you. I finally get to talk to you after uh, many years of admiring you, and we've had many, many requests for you over the years. So this is amazing for me to actually get to talk to you, and uh, I'm sure a lot of our other listeners are going to be so excited to hear from you. So let's kind of start with your running career. Um, As I mentioned, you are one of the legends of the running world. Um, During your peak, you were considered one of the top five marathoners in the world. Um, But for those listeners, outside the US. Will you share a little about your history as a runner, maybe some highlights or whatever you want to talk about, really? Oh, yeah, you bet. You know, it's uh, it's funny because I wasn't much of a runner when I started. I uh, I was 17 years old when I started running and it was just kind of by a almost an accident. I was a real shy kid growing up and I I wanted to you know, get a date with a girl, but I was too bashful. So <laughs> I noticed a lot of my friends in my, the little school I was went to in, in, in Minnesota, they uh, they always had girls hanging around them and they always were wearing their high school letter jackets because they were good in different sports. So I was a I was big into the outdoors and wasn't into athletics. So but I thought, well, gosh, if I can earn myself a letter jacket, 
you know, maybe the girls will just come to me. So I, uh, I went out for football and, you know, I'm six foot tall, weigh 135 pounds soaking wet. And I, I lasted about 45 minutes. And I remember getting gang tackled. And when I got out of that pile of guys, I'm thinking, you know what? There's not a girl alive that's worth going through this. So I quit. And I was so disappointed in myself. But I look back, it's it's one of the greatest things that ever happened because a few days later, a friend of mine told me about this sport called cross-country running, which I'd never heard of. And I thought, well, gosh, if you don't get tackled in it, it can't be that bad. And <laughs> how hard can it be to run? Well, I'd never run before. but So I showed up for my first day of practice, and, and our coach said, uh, all right, boys, Line up out in front of the school. We're going to do the around the block run. Well, I thought, well, gosh, I, I know I can run around the block and stay with my guys. Well, long story short, what they called their around the block run was actually 3.2 miles long. <laughs> and I uh, I had to walk the last mile. Honest to goodness, by the time I got back to my high school, all my teammates and my coach had already showered and gone home. But something magical happened. When I cross that imaginary finish line, I'm thinking, wow, I don't know how far I just ran and walked, but I made it. And I thought, I'll bet you if I, you know, do what my coach tells me to do and, and uh, you know, believe in myself, have some faith, I'll just bet you I can get good enough to make the varsity squad, to earn the letter jacket, to get the date with a girl. And I, um, unfortunately, I, uh, I didn't make the varsity squad that very first season. I was on the JV team. And. Of course, you don't get a letter jacket for being on the JV team. But when when the fall cross country season ended that fall of 1973, I um, uh, the fall of 1974, I should say, I, um, I, uh, I, I didn't run another step until the following spring when school got out. And um, I, that summer, I ran every single day, not real far, or real fast, but every single day. And I came back that fall of 1974. It, yeah, so I started in 73. Fall of 74 was my senior year of high school. And we did that exact same around the block run, that 3.2 mile loop. And this time though, all my teammates, instead of finishing in front of me, they all finished behind <laughs> me. Now that's not saying a whole lot because we didn't have a very good team, but uh, it showed me that, golly, if you're willing to put in the work and the time that, uh, you know, who knows where it might take you. But, you know, saying all that, I never did qualify for the state cross country meet in, in Minnesota or track when I ran track then that following spring, my senior year. Um, but I had fallen in love with the sport. I then went on to a, a college, a very small college, uh, a branch of the University of Minnesota. It was an agricultural college in Waseca, Minnesota, which is now a federal prison. So it kind of tells you about where I... <laughs> I got my degree from, but you know what I found out when I was in college, I had a wonderful coach, Dr. John Folkrod, and um, it seemed like the further I ran, the better I got. And so I ran the, you know, I ran everything in college, the mile, the, the 5k, the 10k, the steeple. And, and then um, my coach one day after practice put his arm around me and he says, you know, Dick, I really believe you can become as good of a runner as you want to be. And I never, ever forgot that. So I ran my very first marathon in uh, 1977. I was 21 years old. I ran the Pavo Nurmi Marathon, still around almost 50 years now, <laughs> in the little town of Hurley, Wisconsin, up in the northeastern corner of the state. And I, I finished, I ran, I think, 247. But I remember thinking, I am never doing one of these <laughs> things again. <laughs> well, three months later, I ran the city of lakes marathon in minneapolis which is kind of that was a prelude to what the uh twin cities marathon is today and i i think i ran 237 there but after that one i re really remember thinking this is it i'm not doing it again and of course i didn't train right for it and then thankfully the good lord helps us forget about some of the bad things we go through and and i realized that uh if you're going to do well at a marathon you got to train for them
Oh, absolutely. And uh, and a successful career you had from there. But before we go on to that, I just, I find it funny that you mentioned about um, finding, you know, using the letter jacket was kind of a motivation for you. And it's funny, we've had quite a few guests on who are male guests who have said the same kind of thing that, really? they, yeah, that they used it, um, like they they wanted it to attract a girl or they saw a girl <laughs> and they thought that would impress her. It's, it's just funny how many people actually say that. So that's it's funny. That's amazing. And I love how vividly you remember those, you know, few snapshots of your early running career. And it just makes me wonder, you know, for those new, newer runners or, you know, even myself or anyone really, it, which memories of yours in your running career are going to define you and you know you think about and you know some of those moments like the moment you crossed that first 3.2 mile run you probably didn't think at that moment that was you would remember that so many years later but you do it's just kind of cool hearing how different people have different uh different moments that matter to them even if they're not specifically a uh you know, uh, like you, you mentioned that over like, you know, the Boston Marathon or something, right. which is kind of cool. Um, so yeah, then you went on to be very, um, successful and you're, uh, I'm sure you're used to this. You're most, uh, well known for your close finish, um, at the Boston Marathon. So can you share that story with us? Just, uh, I think a lot of our listeners would be interested to hear that. Um, Absolutely. I'd be, I'd be happy to, you know, it's hard to believe, but next April it'll be 34 years since I ran that uh, 86th running of the Boston marathon. And I can remember it like it happened yesterday morning. You know, back then the Boston marathon started at 12 noon and you know, it's not the most ideal time of the day to start a marathon, but that was tradition back then. And, And back then they held with all their traditions and, you know, and anybody running Boston, it's always a crapshoot with the the weather. I mean, yeah. I was out there to train, and ten days before the 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 Boston Marathon in 1982, we had a nor'easter move in there, and it snowed two and a half feet. And then on race day, it got to 80 degrees that day. So, <laughs> wow. but I remember standing on the starting line, and um, the starter puts up his his you know, his starting pistol and he hollers one minute. And I remember looking to my right and I, a couple of guys down for me on that front line is Alberto Salazar, who was, was then the world record holder. And I look to my left and, and I see my, my running idol, Bill Rogers standing there. He'd, he'd won the Boston marathon four times. And I'm looking up and down the front row and I'm seeing all these Olympians and world-class athletes from around the globe. And I remember thinking, Dick, what in the heck are you doing on the same start line with these guys? But before it went in one ear and out the other side, I remember thinking, oh, wait a minute. You've done the work. You know, you deserve to be here as much as anybody else. And and with that, the gun went off. And Alberto Salazar, he shot out of that starting area like he was shot from a rocket. And I remember I was right along his side. We went through the first mile of that 26.2 mile race in four minutes and 33 seconds. <laughs> I know. And, and I'm hanging on for dear life. And, you know, hanging on when you still got 25.2 miles to go <laughs> isn't a real uh, pleasant no. thought to have. Uh-uh. But I thought, I, I, Dick, you're just a little nervous, you know, hang in there, you're going to feel good. And I hit mile number two and I felt worse than I did at mile number one. And I'm thinking, okay, what's going on here? But just, you know, hang in here. This is the race you've been pointing for to for months and months. Well, I hit the third mile, and I'm not kidding you. The the first thought that crossed my mind, now I'm one of the most positive people you will ever meet, but the first thought that crossed my mind, I felt so bad was to drop out. Mm -hmm. I thought, I'm just not, I don't have it today. Mm -hmm. I might as well just drop out and save it for another day. And, um, you know, how different my life would be today if I had taken that easy route out. I, I probably wouldn't be talking to you today and who knows what I'd be doing. But I thought, no, Dick, you can't drop out. You've worked too hard for this and hang in there. So I hit the fourth mile and I didn't feel any better, but I didn't feel any worse. And at that point, that was a huge confidence builder yeah. for me. And, and then within the next mile or two, I started feeling really good. And I thought, you know what? Maybe I've got a chance to win this thing. Now, Now back then, there was no uh, fencing or anything like that along the roads. So the, the crowd was right on top of us. And because it was such a beautiful day to spectate, there were 
they said there was a million and a half spectators <laughs> on the course, and I believe it. It was incredible. Now, get this. Back then, there were no aid stations. You just got water from anybody that was handing it out. So I remember running by people, and I'd grab a cup of water, and I'd look at it. And if it looked pretty clear, I'd drink it. And if it looked a little discolored, I thought, ah, I better not. You know, you never know what somebody might have done. And um, so I'm in that lead pack, and as each mile went by, the, that lead group got smaller and smaller until we got to the 17-mile point, and there were two guys left in that lead group, Alberto Salazar, the world record holder, and as the Boston Globe newspaper had dubbed me the day before, Dick Beardsley, the country bumpkin from Minnesota. <laughs> and, and nobody had given me, or for that matter, anyone else much of a chance against Salazar. Well, when you get to the 17-mile point is when basically you take your first turn on the course, and it's on the Commonwealth Avenue. It's at the, the famed fire station there, and that's where all the fun begins. The next four miles is where the big hills are. And my coach, Bill Squires, told me, he says, Dickie, if you're in that lead group, when you make that turn and start heading into the hills, I want you to run every hill as hard as you can on the ups and even harder on the way down to try to break away from everybody. And my coach, Bill Squires, one of the greatest coaches in the world, I would have done anything he told me to do. And so I remember rounding that corner and we got to that first hill and I ran it as hard as I could trying to shake Alberto. He was right there. Second hill, same thing. Third hill, same thing. And then we're at the, the bottom of, of Heartbreak Hill, the infamous Heartbreak Hill. And, you know, it's the longest, probably steepest hill on the course. And I remember running up it literally as hard as I could. And I remember getting to the top and I just kind of glanced over my left shoulder and Alberto was right, you know, in my back left pocket. So coming down the backside of of Heartbreak Hill, you've got Boston College on the right, and it's a gradual downhill. And seriously, I ran it like I was running the 100-meter dash trying to break away from Selazar, and I got down to the bottom where it flattened out, and I didn't even have to look behind to see if Alberta was there. I could hear him breathing. And at that point, I could no longer feel my legs. And, I'm, and, and the thought of running five more miles at the pace we were running or faster was almost making me sick to my stomach. Mm -hmm. But I knew as bad as I was hurting, Alberto had to be hurting just as bad. Now, you got to remember back then, in those days, we didn't have goos and gels and jelly beans and yeah. things like that. Uh, but the one thing we had back then, and the one thing that runners have today, and you have with you as long as you walk the face of the earth 24 seven, and that's that powerful stuff the good lord put between your ears called the brain mm -hmm. and it's it's powerful powerful stuff and if you use it right it can work to your benefit and i remember thinking to myself okay dick you know no matter how bad you're hurt you can run one more mile and my brain convinced my body that okay body all you got to do is run one more mile and you're going to win this race so next thing i know i i see the uh the 22nd mile mark and and uh, I'm thinking, oh, gosh, that went pretty well. One more mile, Dick. And, man, there's the 23rd. I still got a stride and a half lead. And I say it again, just one more mile, and there's the 24th. And at this point, the crowds are so loud, you can't even imagine what it's like. And up to about the 22nd mile, most everybody seemed to be cheering for Alberto Salazar because, you know, he grew up out mm. in the Boston area. But then it changed. They weren't cheering all for Alberto. They weren't cheering all for me. They were cheering for both of us Aww. because they were seeing two young American boys, basically, going head to head from the very beginning. And now it was coming down to the last few miles. And and then what I saw next on that road is something I'll never forget as long as I live. In blue and gold paint, it said 25.2 miles. And then right below that, it said one mile to go. And at that point, I got so weak kneed and rubber legged, I honestly didn't know if I'd be able to take another step. And for some reason at that point, my tears just started streaming down my cheeks. And at that point, for some reason, I flashed back to that day in 1970, in May of 1975, when I walked off my high school stage 
the first one in my family to get a high school diploma. And I remember walking out to my where my mom and dad were sitting and my dad, who had an eighth grade education, was crying. And I remember handing my dad my diploma and he handed me an envelope and he said, D, this is your graduation gift from your mom and I. So I opened it up and I pulled out this small piece of paper and in my dad's eighth grade handwriting, it said, D, this is good for round trip airfare to the Boston Marathon. Maybe someday you'll want to run it. Love, mom and dad. So here I am not just running it. I am winning it. And I knew my mom and dad are back home in Minnesota watching it on television. I remember thinking, okay, Dick, you have got to get your mind off your mom and dad. Think about something else. So I thought about back to a terrible blind date I once went on in high school. (laughs) Wow, that's amazing. so So I was able to get my mind off my mom and dad, back into the race, and with about 900 meters to go. Just think about that. That's a little over two laps around your local high school track. I had the biggest lead I'd had all day long, about an arm length and a half. And I knew Alberto didn't have a great finishing kick, but I knew he had a lot better one than I had. So I thought, okay, Richard, you have got to make one last hard push to try to break open that gap. And when I did, I got the biggest Charlie horse in my right hamstring. I'm sure I was dehydrated because Mm. we didn't get much fluids out there. And I mean, at that point, it cramped up so bad and Alberto went flying by me like I was standing still. I'm thinking, I'm thinking I'm having a bad nightmare. And I'm thinking, am I going to be able to even finish? And pretty soon, Salazar had five meters on me, then 10, then 20. And at one point, he had almost a 100-meter lead. But I'll tell you this. I learned more about myself those last two minutes of that race that has enabled me to get through way, way more tougher things in my life than that 1982 Boston Marathon. And what I learned on those streets in Boston almost 34 years ago is that no matter how difficult the situation you're in is, and no matter how high that so-called mountain is to climb, is that you never, ever give up. As long as you're moving forward towards that so-called finish line, there's always that hope. And it's about believing in yourself and, and having faith and determination and that commitment. And it's about being in the right place at the right time. And as Alberto continued to get further and further ahead, I'm running along the right-hand side of the crowd the best I can, trying to work that cramp out. And the crowd moved back to let me come by Well, when they moved back, I didn't see a pothole in the road, and I stepped in it and almost fell down. But when I pretty near fell down, it kind of jerked my right leg, and when it did, it popped the knot right out. All of a sudden, the knot was gone, the pain was gone, and now I had my stride back. And I remember looking over my shoulder, and I didn't see anybody coming, and I looked ahead, and I could see about it eight, nine motorcycles, and Alberta was kind of in the middle of them. And I remember thinking, now we're down to, you know, 600, 700 meters to go. And I'm thinking, okay, Dick, if you finish second and give it your very, very best, you can hold your head high. But if you give up now, if you don't give every last ounce of energy, you're going to regret it for the rest of your life. And um, I started pumping my arms and lifting my legs And honestly, I was given a gear at that point like I'd never had before. Never before that race or ever since that race was I given a gear like that. And it felt like I was on a magic carpet. And I remember coming off of Commonwealth Avenue and turning on to Hereford Street. And it seemed like for every 10 yards Alberta was going, I was going 20. And I I can still hear... When I watched the video of that race, Bob LaBelle, the the um, sportscaster that made the final call, and it still gives me goosebumps. We're coming around the corner, and Alberto comes around onto Hereford Street first, and I'm and and he goes, and Alberto Salazar presumably is going to win this 1982 Boston Marathon as he's outdueled Dick Beardsley. But about the time he says that, I come around that corner, and then all of a sudden, but Bob goes, but watch Beardsley. He's making a move, but the motorcycles, they got to get out of the way. And, you know, over the years, I've had people 
say, ah, oh, Dick, if those motorcycles hadn't got in your way, the way you were coming on Salazar, surely you would have won the race. And, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. I've never, ever, ever use that as an excuse. Never have, never will. Because if you watch that race, did the motorcycles get in my way a little bit? Well, a, a, a little bit, but I was able to get around them. And I got around them on the final turn and I caught back up to Alberta with about 150 meters to go. And so basically what happened was after running over 26 miles, it now came down to basically a hundred meter sprint. <laughs> and, and that day, you know, we both broke the American record and the Boston course record. It was the first day or the first time in history that two men had ever gone under two hours and nine minutes in the same marathon. And Alberta that day finished in two hours, eight minutes and 51 seconds. And I was right behind him in two hours, eight minutes and 52.6 seconds. So I remember coming across that finish line, both of us literally hardly able to stand. And if the volunteers hadn't been there to hold us up, we would have both, you know, been um, on the ground. I remember looking up, still the clock reading 208. And I'm thinking, I just ran a 208 marathon and I remember at that time, only one or two people had ever run in the 208s before. And I got second. <laughs> I'm thinking, how can that be? But, you know, this is what I so love about this wonderful sport of running. Here were two young American boys that just hammered at each other for over two hours, trying to put the other one into the ground. Yet when we crossed that finish line virtually arm in arm, we fell into each other's arms gave each other a big hug and congratulated each other on a race well ran. And then as they were trying to get Alberto over to the podium where the governor of Massachusetts was and the mayor of Boston to uh, give him one of the most coveted of awards in, in my opinion, all of sports, mm -hmm. but especially in running to be presented with the Laurel wreath for being the Boston marathon champion. As I was being escorted, trying to get into the garage of the Prudential insurance building to do a press conference I happened to go by that podium stand and Alberta was standing up there and he happened to look down the same time I was looking up and without hesitation on his part, he reached down and grabbed my arm and he brought me up on that podium stand with him. And when they were raising his arm in victory, he was raising mine oh. right along with it. And, and that's something I'll never forget as long as I live. Wow, that is amazing! What a, now I can definitely see why you uh, why you're such a good motivational speaker. There, you had me, and I'm sure everyone listening like so enthralled in that story. And that was, I mean, it, it brings chills to me. It brings like all these emotions of so many things. And wow, that's thank you so much for sharing that. That was uh, absolutely oh, very incredible welcome. to hear. And I I hadn't heard it in that much detail before, so that was amazing. And uh, you know, there was me thinking I would ask you, you know, oh, were you devastated at the finish? But you know, it it sounds like the complete opposite. Like you realized just how special that was. And of course, that thought was in your mind, like, how did I not win it with that time? But I mean, what a what a duel there. Although, well, at, go on. Well, Tina, you know what? And I was I was so disappointed. I was happy yet disappointed. Okay, yeah. And I remember going back to my hotel room eventually, and I'm thinking, okay, what could I have done differently mm -hmm. to make it me in front yeah. and Alberto second? And I basically went through every step of every mile from Hopkinton into downtown Boston. And when I got through analyzing my whole race, I was smiling ear to ear because I couldn't have done anything different. That's, that's that what day, you want. That's what you want. Mm -hmm. That day, both of us, we didn't give it 90% or 95% or 110% because that's impossible. But that day, we both gave it 100%. Neither one of us ever ran that fast again. That race took that much out of us. So when you look back, I have absolutely no regrets and um, I wouldn't change that race. And I know a lot of people think, well, you're just saying that because you didn't win. But honestly, I would not trade that second place finish against Alberto with that kind of race versus me winning the Boston Marathon in in 210 and, and winning by a, a minute or something. I would not exchange a win for that any day. Mm -hmm. 
Wow. Yeah, I, I could see why. And that that's exactly at the end of the day, you you did the ultimate, you know, you you absolutely left it all out there. And, um, you know, it, I, I love how humbling it is. You're so, it's admirable that you, you know, you even with all that, you still see, not only see the positive, but you see it as like a life changing moment. And you see it as a point in time that you know, will never be taken away from you. And like they say, pain is temporary, glory is forever. Well, you <coughs> truly are showing that, that, you know, you, you, you gave it all and, you know, you got the results from it and it changed your life. I mean, I'm guessing, you know, the, the rest of your life from there, you know, no one ever didn't take you seriously. And, uh, did it ever, would you ever say that at a point in the future and a race in the future that you thought about that moment and were like, I'm not going to let that, I'm not going to like lose the last few seconds again. Did it help you anywhere down the road in a race? Well, I don't know if it helped or not, but I, I know what it, I know what that race sure did. After that race, every race I went to, it didn't matter if it was a Ma and Pa 10K or a big race somewhere. I had a big bullseye on my back. Yeah, everybody yeah. is at that point, everybody's out to beat you. Mm -hmm. And I did feel a little more pressure of like, I felt like I, I felt like I had to perform great in every race that I ran after that, mm -hmm. you know, in my mind. And of course, some races I ran pretty good. Other races I stunk it up. And, and it, it took me a while to, to realize that, you know what, Dick, you just you go out and, and, and run the race the best you can. And some days you're going to win races and some days you're going to not win races. And, and if you look at anybody's running career at a high level, I don't care who it is. When you look at all the races that I've run, and yes, I was fortunate to to win a number of them, but you know what? I finished second and third and fourth and fifth and 155th a lot more times than I ever finished first. So mm -hmm. we got to put it in perspective a little bit too. Yeah, and well, I also think, you know, it's good for people to hear that in that race, that epic race, I hate the word epic, but that that is what describes that race. Um you you know you didn't feel great the first mile and I think a that shows people that not only do elite runners you know people as talented and as incredible you know racing and almost beating Alberto Salazar who was like untouchable at that time um not only do you feel could you feel bad the first you know not just one two three four miles but up to five miles in um consider dropping out and yet you came back and ran that race and then just, you know, the fact that you were able to do what you did, it's just, I think it's great for people to see that, um, you know, it's, it, running is what you make of it and it's what you kind of uh, give to it. It gives back, gives back what you give it. So it's really, Absolutely. really amazing to hear you say that and uh, very inspiring. And did you happen to, did the motorcyclist say anything to you after the race? I'm just curious. Were they you're like, no. oh, sorry, we got in your way or anything? Or was it just they were No, gone? no, they, they never did. But um, I did, um, I think it was the 10th anniversary of that race. They brought Alberto and I back. And um, one of the police officers who was on one of the motorcycles that day did come up to me and uh, and apologize <laughs> for, you know, think they thought I was basically out of the race. That's why they kind of surrounded Alberto, so they didn't see me coming up at the end. And and I, you know, and I, and I we did, I just laughed about it and said, hey, dude, I had no hard <laughs> feelings about it. Like I said, I never used it as an excuse. But one of the newspaper articles. The next day in the Boston Globe, it said I had tire tracks on my back. You know, that's <laughs> typical media trying to, you know, fill the headlines, I guess, with some bizarre things. So it it was it was people made more big thing out of it than than it in my opinion that yeah. it really was. Now the good thing is that the following year they started putting up fencing to keep the crowds back. They cut way back on the motorcycles. So that was a good thing that came from that mm -hmm. particular race. Yeah, yeah. And it's a great lesson in, you know, even just that part alone, a great lesson in never giving up with, you know, you said how much ground he put on you and then you you caught it back up. So great lesson. Yeah. There. Would you say that race then was your greatest accomplishment um, as a runner or is there another moment that kind of sticks out to you? You know, um, People ask me that a lot. What's your, you know, what's your greatest race? Mm -hmm. And um, 
a lot of people think it's that Boston Marathon or maybe London or the Grandma's Marathon when I ran 209 back in Duluth, Minnesota in 1981. But my greatest race, and, and it wasn't really a race, but it was, um, it kind of it kind of turned into one, but it was a, a short little two mile jaunt um, because I never thought it would happen. It was with my son, Andy. And um, <clears throat> it's kind of a neat story because he, uh, my son, Andy was kind of a couch potato growing up and he just wasn't into fitness or anything like that. And, um, but he joined the army and he was, he just gotten back from basic training and then he was getting ready to, to head to Germany where he was going to be stationed. And so him and I though, we, we drove out to my sisters in Montana in Helena for my niece's high school graduation. So we stopped over in Miles city, Montana for the night. And I got up the next morning, went for a run and I came back and my son, Andy is standing there in his running shoes, his army shorts and an army shirt. He says, Hey pop, let's go do a couple. And I'm looking, I'm going a couple of what? Get a couple of beers. What are you, what are you? <laughs> oh, let's go out and run a couple miles. And I go, oh, okay. And I'm going, thank you, Lord. Cause I never, ever thought I would see the day when I would be running a couple miles with my son, Andy. So we get outside the hotel and I had my Garmin on. I said, well, how about we'll go out a mile and turn around. He says, okay, sounds good. So off we go, and he's setting a pretty good pace. Well, towards the end of that first mile, we go down this long, pretty steep hill, and we get to the bottom, and I go, my my Garmin chimed. I go, Andy, there's a mile. We got to turn around. He says, okay, Pop. And I'm thinking, well, he's going to be walking back up that hill. So we turn around, and we start going back up this steep hill. Now, he slows down, but he's not walking. He's still running pretty good. Well, we get to the top, and it flattens out. And he takes off <sighs> and I'm doing everything I can to stay with him. And we finally get back to the hotel and we stop and he turns and he, he gives me a big hug <clears throat> and he says, um, thanks pop. And, um, that without doubt is my greatest run I've ever had. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, one that, um, I'll remember as long as I live. Yeah, that's yeah. my greatest. That's my greatest run, my greatest race. No, and I can definitely see that. And uh, you know, for I don't know how much you want me to say for those listening, but um, uh, Andy is no longer with us, so that you know, I can see why that's a very special moment for Dick. And uh, you know, thank you for sharing that. I, I mean, that makes that makes me smile even thinking about having a run with my child someday. And I'm, well, I'm, I'm, thank just, you, Tina, because. You know, um, yeah, my, my, my son, Andy, um, you know, he, he fought in Iraq and he got, you know, back from there. And, and but unfortunately, um, he, uh, he died, uh, about a month ago. And, um, so it's been, a, it's been difficult. And, but even before that, when people would ask me about my greatest run, it was yeah. even before he passed oh, on, I would amazing. say that was my greatest run. Yeah. And, um, so to still have that memory, and yeah. we'll always have that memory. Uh, it's it's even more special now. Yeah, and it just shows the importance. Like with running, it's it's not about those you know fantastic moments. Like um, I was reading. Uh, who was I talking to? I was talking to someone recently on the podcast, and uh, they were saying about how um, it wasn't you know those historic moments where they got all the glory and everything, but it was uh, as Luke P uh, Pukestra. P Sorry, I'm hacking the name there. Um, and uh, uh, he was saying that, you know, it's more about being with the family and, you know, it's kind of running. We think about running and our best moments are those moments where you get all the glory and you run this big PR, but often it is when you have your family around you. Like I know my greatest run so far was the London Marathon where my family and friends were all around. It, it's amazing how much it comes back to that, that it's not – that race that's, you know, um, the big well-known race that everyone kind of is watching. It's usually one where your loved ones are there or your, it's your hometown or something like that. So yeah, you've confirmed well, you know, it's that. Funny, it's funny you bring that up because if you look at my, my, what's my greatest marathon that I've run, people think it's the Boston marathon that sticks out the most and believe me, that's right up there. But the one that sticks out the most was, 
the Grandma's Marathon in my home state of Minnesota in Duluth in 1981, my mom and dad were at the finish line. It was and it was the first time they'd ever seen me run a marathon. And, you know, I came through and I, I ended up was fortunate to win that day and ran 209. And my dad, who you could literally hit over the head with a two by four and he wouldn't cry, was crying. Aww. And that was so special to to be there. And, and my dad hugging me because my dad never had the opportunity to, to do athletics or anything like that. And my mom is standing there and she's crying. And it was just really uh, an amazing moment for me to have yeah. both my folks there. Absolutely. And it, it really does come down to that, doesn't it? Having having your loved ones around you during the those running moments are what make life make the running life worthwhile. Um, so then with your running career, um, was when you retired from running, was it a specific moment? Like, did you have like a goodbye race or something or was it an injury or how did your running career kind of come to an end? Well, it, it, it really kind of started coming to an end pretty briefly after, after Boston. Yeah. I, um, I ran the Grandma's Marathon again in, in 1982 and it was only 62 days after Boston wow. and I was... I, I recovered quickly from marathons, but that race so beat me up, not only physically, but mentally. Yeah. And, but I, uh, I, I ran grandma's and, and was fortunate to win it a second time. And, and then, you know, back then, I don't know. I just, I thought I could run through a brick wall and I'd never been injured up to that point. And, and I just, you know, I got back from grandma's. I went up to Alaska and that week after grandma's, I, I ran two 10 K's up in Alaska and, um, <laughs> I get back from Alaska and and I'm I'm back training full time and my Achilles my left Achilles started hurting and anyhow long story short I ended up uh, um, snapping my Achilles twice. Ouch! It, they repaired it once and um, they said no running for six months. But uh, the Olympic trials were coming up for 1984 and it was my best shot and. And so six weeks later, I was back training and I was out in Los Angeles running a race out there and I came around a corner and it snapped again. And so that kept me out of the 84, any chance at the 84 Olympics. And it basically kept me out of running for about a year and a half, two years to let it heal. And then I got back and I thought, I'm going to give it one more shot for 1988. And I qualified um, with a two hour and 16 minute marathon out the Napa Valley marathon in 1987. And I went to the Olympic trials in as good a shape as I ever was. And I knew knowing that either I was going to make the Olympic team and go on to Seoul, South Korea, or if I didn't, that was going to be my last kind of race at that real high level. And unfortunately, I, I had a terrible race that day, but I was going to finish if I had to crawl in and I partner had to crawl in. Mm -hmm. But when I finished, you know what? I came across the finish line. I mean, the top three guys that made the Olympic team were already, they probably already been taking a nap already by the time I finished. But I, I got done. And when I crossed the finish line, I was, I was smiling. And because I, I knew it was time now to, to kind of, to move on. And I was, I was, I think I was only 31 years old, but I just, I just felt time and, mm -hmm. and I was still always going to be a runner, but it was time to, to move on. And I moved back to, you know, our Minnesota dairy farm and I, I was milking cows and I've been a fishing guide since I was 12 years old. So I, I, you know, continued to do that and continued to run, but that was pretty much um, after the 1988 Olympic marathon trials, I pretty much hung up my shoes from a uh, an elite world class level uh, running and and um, but continued to run, continued to race, you know, into my 40s and 50s, and now I'll be 60 next spring, and I'm slower than molasses in January now compared to what I was then. But I I tell you what, Tina, I go to bed at night, and I can hardly wait to get up in the morning to go for a run. Aww. That's how much I love it. Yeah. That's how, how you want to keep it. And amazing that you were able to, you know, kind of make a break, make a clean break with, like, be at peace with it so so easily. Whereas you hear a lot of people, like, struggle. They keep trying to come back and 
he keep having those injuries, but that's great you did that. But I love that you keep it as a part of your life. And that's something, again, that we all hope for. We all want to, you know, just keep with it and keep loving it and not get to the point where you're like, oh, I have to go for a run. Like, Absolutely. I love that you still have that passion there. And, you know, that's kind of shown through your um motivational speaking which actually everyone is getting kind of a glimpse of even through this interview and we'll go into that a little more but before we kind of get to that I just wanted to ask you a little more if you don't mind sharing about after you retired from running you went through some struggles with uh, painkillers and was that going on towards the end of your was that the Achilles issue that kind of started that or what happened there? No it wasn't the Achilles issue at all actually when I so when I retired from that competitive running we moved back to our farm in Minnesota. And then on November 13th of 1989. So what's that? 26 years ago now coming up. Yeah. 26 years ago coming up, I got in a big hurry one morning and I, uh, I got myself wrapped up in a, in an auger type piece of equipment on our farm and, and got all, I'm lucky I didn't get killed, but I, you know, I busted all my ribs on my right side and punctured my lung and my right arm got broken. And, um, my, my, um, left leg partner got torn off and, but I had incredible doctors and surgeons and nurses and physical therapists. And, you know, they put me back together and, um, but that's where I got my first taste of narcotic pain medication. And, you know, like most people, you're on it for a short period of time. They wean you off of it, no problems. And that's the way it was with me. And and then, unfortunately, about two years later, um, I got in a bad car accident when a lady ran a stop sign and I busted up my back and had to have more surgeries. And, and anyhow, one thing led to another. And I got ended up getting addicted to these narcotic painkillers. Now, you're looking at a kid growing up. I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. I've never done any illicit drug. And now you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hooked on these crazy painkillers. And, you know, I started when I couldn't get any more pills from one doctor, I'd get, I'd go to another doctor and then another and another. And then when I ran out of doctors, you know, I started doing something that I can't even comprehend, even thinking about doing, let alone actually doing. I started to forge my own prescriptions. That's how out of control my life was. And, you know, I, I knew that obviously it was illegal. I knew I could go to prison. I knew I could lose everything I'd ever worked for in my life. But at that point, all that mattered was to get the drugs, to take the drugs and make sure I didn't get caught. Now, by August of 1996, I was taking a cocktail of Percocet, Demerol and Valium, all very highly addictive drugs. 80 to 90 pills a day wow. and that I didn't die is an absolute miracle. And what's even a bigger miracle. And I think the good Lord every single day is that, you know, I didn't end up hurting or killing some innocent person. You know, I was driving my vehicle lots of times down the road under the influence, barely able to keep my eyes open. You know how easy it would have been for me to have blacked out and gone across the center line and who knows what could have happened to somebody, but thankfully, thank the good Lord, it never did. But, and then thankfully I, on September 30th of 1996, I got caught and I knew I was in a lot of trouble, but I was so blessed and so thankful that I was still alive. And I knew the only chance I had, if there was any chance at all to get better was to be 100% truthful and take responsibility for my actions. And, and that's what I did. And, you know, I got into a treatment program and I was very, you know, I I felt terrible about what I had done. And, and, um, I wasn't, I was given probation and and no jail time or anything like that. But, uh, luckily I I got into a, a really good treatment program and God willing, um, coming up in February, it'll be, uh, 19 years of sobriety from those narcotic painkillers. So, um, I'm uh, very blessed with with that. That's for sure. Yeah. And then during that time, like, did your loved ones like know what was going on, or were they aware, like, to some extent of how like addicted you were? I was really good at hiding you it. My, it. Yeah. Yeah. Really good at hiding it. You know, my my um, my two sisters thought something was going on. My dad, who was dying of of cancer, he died in July of 1996. And um, 
of pancreatic cancer, his dying wish was for me to get help. They knew something was going on. My, my former wife, Mary, you know, she knew something was going on, but they couldn't, you mm-hmm. know, I was mm-hmm. so good at hiding it. Yeah. And I was so good at lying about it if, that, if, if I was asked. And I, I'm not that type of a person, but, you know, it's amazing what, what those drugs can do to a person. They yeah. can just change you. And, um, but uh, thankfully, like I said, I got caught and was able to get help, but, you know, it put a lot of stress on, on my son, Andy, he was just a little boy. And of course, being from a little town, um, when, when the news broke, of course, uh, it was all over the newspapers Mm -hmm. and the news, not because it, not because of, it happens to a lot of people, but because of the runner I once was, it was a news story. And, and I felt terrible for my family, um, way as as hard as it was for me it was i think it was worse on them because uh you know my son andy was i don't know six or sixth grade at the time and you know kids you know mean kids can be yeah. each other and they thought you know i was a drug dealer you know they were and and my then wife mary you know from being from a small town you know it was just really difficult yeah. for everybody but um especially for them would you say that was kind of worse um like this the physical struggles you went through in your races, would you say, you know, that's hard on you physically and emotionally, but I'm imagining this was significantly worse. Like, you know, a hundred times, a hundred times worse. Uh, You know, when I, when I got into, into the hospital then and, and going through the withdrawals from the opiates, I can't even begin to tell you how nasty it was. I mean, I basically went for a, a week without sleeping. And I, I would lay in the hospital bed at night crying because I, I, I ached so bad in my bones and my arms and legs. I can't even describe it to you, but I remember thinking if I would have had access to a saw, I think I would have sawed off my arms and legs. It would have had to felt better than what I was going wow. through. And, and in the morning, it was just an effort just to get my legs on the outside of the bed and to put on a clean pair of pants. It seemed like it, it took me forever. And there were, there were mornings that when I was supposed to get up, walk down the hallway of the hospital to my group meeting to try to learn how to get better. But there were mornings I was so sick. I couldn't even walk. I had to crawl on my hands and knees like a dog crawling along the floor. And I remember one day, crawling along the hallway of the hospital trying to get down to my group meeting and I I blacked out and I remember waking up in my own vomit and I remember at that point looking up and saying God either just please help get me better or just take me and um, that night I slept that night for a little bit for the first time in over a week and then a little more the next day. And, you know, after I'd been there for about 21 days, I started feeling what it was like to be Dick Beardsley again, without all that Mm -hmm. drugs in my Mm -hmm. system. And I really enjoyed how it made me feel. And, um, again, I was just very fortunate to, to get through it. Yeah. Wow. What a story. And, uh, thank you for sharing that. And, um, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of that has, and obviously other things you went through in your life, which you've mentioned earlier, have helped you become the motivational speaker that you are. And, you know, you talk to you one of the best in the world. Um, but do you have any specific advice for what you for some like advice you would give to a runner who might be in a state of struggle, either in their running or just in their life? And they feel like they want to get that like control back. Do you have any any advice for people who are struggling? You know what? <clears throat> Uh, I'll share something with the listeners that I never used to share it with anybody. And then, um, I don't know, a couple, three years ago, at the end of one of my talks, it just felt like uh, the right moment to share this. And it's now I share it pretty much every at the end of every one of my talks. And it's 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 something I try to do every morning and anybody can do it. And it's always helped me immensely, no matter if it's I'm having a great day or a rotten day or whatever it might be. And it's these four things are this. When I wake in the morning, I try to wake up with a smile on my face, enthusiasm in my voice, joy in my heart, and faith in my soul. And those four things have gotten me through um, 
a lot of difficult times and um, hopefully they'll help some of the listeners get through some of theirs also. Absolutely. Thank you. That is great advice and very true. And I've actually had a lot of people recently even mentioning, you know, if you're struggling in a race to try and smile because it just changes your whole perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's great. Thank you so much. Um, and just one other thing I was thinking uh, while you were talking a few minutes ago, um, with the the way you became addicted, do you do you think there's any way that maybe runners have that kind of that we tend to be like addictive kind of people as we're so passionate about things that we tend to like hone in on one thing and like, you know, just put all our energy and focus into it. Do you think Absolutely. there could be any relation? Yeah. Absolutely. I obviously have an addictive personality. Um, there was like back in my heyday of running. I mean, I, I never, I wouldn't, I never missed a day of running. I ran twice a day, seven days a week. Mm-hmm. And Rain, snow, sleet, hot, the coldest I ever ran, and this is actual temperature, was February of 1982. It was minus six zero, minus yeah. 60 <laughs> back home in Minnesota. And um, I still went out and got my run in. And so I think most runners, especially people that have been doing it for a long time or take it quite seriously, have that addictive personality. I think if you harness that that type of personality it can be really really good yeah. in certain things um now saying that um it can also not be a good thing too now uh, i still run pretty much every day but you know what if i miss a day i don't worry about it anymore where you know back in my younger days it's like man if i miss a day of running oh i'm gonna get out of shape well that's how goofy <laughs> i was thinking you know back then but i i think if I think most top distance runners have, you almost have to have a little bit of an addictive personality to get to the top, to be willing to, to push, push, push Mm -hmm. when you don't want to. And it was, you know, I've done uh, with all the drugs I was taking. I mean, man, if I decided I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it to the yeah, best of my yeah. ability. It's a blessing and a curse at the same time. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, great. That's uh, Yeah, I just was thinking about that, and I, it would make sense, wouldn't it, because we do tend to, like exactly what you said about, you know, getting your run dons and non-runners kind of always say to us, like, what is wrong with you? Why can't you just right. take a day? But, <laughs> like, to runners, we can't do that. Um, so then what's the best way for people to keep in touch with you or follow, you know, follow up with what you're up to and, um, yes. is there an easy way to reach you? The the best way to reach me, like for speaking opportunities or anything like that, I do also online coaching if, if anybody's interested in that and it's all individualized programs, but the best way is either to reach me is either dick at Mm dickbeardsley.com or my wife jill handles all all my speaking and it's and her email address is jill at jillbeardsley.com so what time out jill at (laughs) dickbeardsley.com yep yep and that's how i got her as well okay great and then i would also encourage people to check out uh the website which i will put a link to on the show notes at runnersconnect.net forward slash rc83 And so what does the future look like for you right now? Do you have anything planned or is there, I'm guessing you're going to keep on inspiring and doing talks, but what, what would you, what do you see yourself doing in the future now? Well, I'm I'm very excited when, when my wife, Jill and I married eight years ago, I, uh, I had to move to Texas Mm -hmm. and I bleed Minnesota and, but through it, I got two wonderful stepsons, uh, Christopher and Matthew and, Christopher's off to college and Matthew's got one more this year left of high school. And then I'm really excited because we're moving back to my home area and we bought a, um, a bed and breakfast in Bemidji, oh, Minnesota. Wow. So um, I I'm excited about that. And I'm excited to get back into my, um, I go back every summer to guide back home, uh, fishing guide, but now to be back there on a permanent basis, I, I can't even begin to tell you how excited I am to get back and, Go snowshoeing and <laughs> look at those northern lights in the in the fall and the winter time and uh, going out ice fishing and snowmobiling and uh, I'm just really excited. So we got some good things coming up here down the road. Yeah, and anyone? Uh, what was the name of the bed and breakfast again? 
It's uh, Lake Bemidji Bed and Breakfast. Lake Bemidji. So uh, if anyone wants to go visit and uh, have a place to stay, you should check that out. I'll see oh, if I you can... betcha. And, I, and, of course, I'll keep uh, – I so love to get out and, and speak. You know, I speak a lot to schools and running events and corporations, and I just love doing it. I have a passion for it. Mm-hmm. And it enables me to, to meet some really wonderful people all over the world. Oh, yeah. And I mean, even anyone listening today, I'm sure we've enjoyed it. And, you know, I can't believe this time has gone by so quickly. I had so many more things I wanted to ask you about, but um you know, it's uh, it's just amazing talking to you and hearing you speak, and I can see why <laughs> why you are such a hit. Um, do you have any parting guidance for our listeners uh, with you know running or life or anything? You already gave, I guess, your um, usual fi- uh, finish to your speeches, but anything else you'd like to kind of say? Yeah, I guess you know what for the the runners out there. I know some days running can get a little bit tedious, but um, just realize how fortunate you are. And when somebody is, you know, honks at you, gives you that mad honk, you know, that you get sometimes, just look at them and think they must uh, not be having a very good day or they're either <laughs> either that or they're sitting there with a box of donuts and a cup of coffee and a pack of cigarettes next to them. And they're thinking, I wish I could be out there yeah. doing what those yeah. people are doing. Absolutely. So just in, in, enjoy your enjoy every run. Even if it's a slow run, even if you run a race and it's and it's not a the the kind of time or place that you're hoping to, knowing that you're out there doing something good for yourself, it's got to put a smile on your face. Absolutely, absolutely. I was I was writing actually on my blog recently about how um, you know most runners think that other people that drive past them or other runners are thinking, oh, they're moving so slowly. Oh, look how slow they're going. But in reality, most people. If they are a runner and they drive past another runner, they're wishing they were running. They were wishing they were out there. And if they're not a runner, then they don't. They don't probably don't even notice you on the side of the road because they don't care. So Absolutely. it's funny how um, yeah we we think <laughs> we have this thing in our head of what people are thinking, but in reality they're actually not. So yep. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And uh, it was absolutely fascinating talking to you today. And thank you for sharing your story. And I would encourage listeners to definitely go check everything out on the website and kind of learn more about where you can uh, hear Dick speaking in the future. Thanks, Tina. We'll have to do it again someday. Yes, thank you. I told you he was inspirational. Some people just know how to share their stories in a way that keep you paying attention and focused the entire time. With our goldfish-like attention spans right now, that can be tough to do, but he does it so well. I could have talked to him for another hour, so maybe I'll have him back in the future. I don't know. See what you guys think. Now, I just wanted to share that I actually leave for my honeymoon to Australia tomorrow on December 4th, and for that reason, I'm going to have very limited access to email. Okay, well, I shouldn't say access, but my husband and I have promised that we're going to make the most of this time with no working. So if anyone does email me, I apologize if it takes me a few weeks to respond. That being said, if you do have any feedback for this episode or any other episode, I would love to hear from you, tina at runnersconnect.net. There will still be a podcast episode up each week, so don't worry. I just won't be around as much as usual. Although that's when I should say that I would love if you could subscribe to the podcast. That way you get the podcast straight to your phone or to your tablet or wherever you're listening to this. So then I don't have to kind of reach out as much as I usually would. All right. So I am off to the other side of the world. Wish me luck on my 17 hour flight. If I make it through that and have a great time, I will talk to you again soon. Have a great week.